What I'm going to be doing today, <clears throat> I'll just warn you, is prepping you for tomorrow night. So I want you to get kind of warmed up on this uh, so that tomorrow night <clears throat> you won't get the sensation that it's just coming at you with great guns. Of course, it probably you'll get that sensation anyway because it's radical, I'm going to tell you. I've, I've never had the Lord give me such a radical word as he has for this coming year, and it's all good. Uh, <clears throat> so let's get right into this. If you would hold your hands out toward me and just pray in the Spirit that the Lord would give me utterance, that he would give me uh, accuracy. Father, I thank you that as I speak this morning under the unction of the Holy Ghost, that I speak the words that you have uh, in, inspired me to speak, that you've instructed me to speak. May they come forth with power and effectiveness in the lives of the hearers. And for that, I give you thanksgiving and praise in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. If you're taking notes this morning, and you really should be, the title is uh, Eve, E-V-E, of the Ages to Come. The Eve of the Ages to Come, and I'll explain what that means. <clears throat> I'll start and end with this scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. <clears throat> verse 6 says, And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now we're all familiar with that verse of scripture that the Lord has raised us up in authority with him. We are, heavenly places indicates a place of ultimate authority. He has placed us with him in authority. In fact, he's given us that ministry of reconciliation, that ministry of authority in the earth. We are Jesus' voice in the earth. Amen. The only way they're going to see Jesus in the earth is through you. And so you have a very important part to play as a believer. So he raised us up, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, that in the ages to come. Say with me, ages to come. Ages to come. Now, Paul was writing this ages ago. Are you getting where I'm coming from? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, in that anointing that destroys yokes and removes burdens that is in Jesus, that represents Jesus. He is the anointed Messiah. Now, the Amplified Bible puts it this way. <clears throat> and this is to prepare you for what we're going to be getting into tomorrow night. Same verse in the Amplified Translation. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace. Somebody shout out, no limits. His unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Wow. He, he not only said that he might demonstrate his grace and kindness, he said immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches. So, see, there's no limit to what God has available for us. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians uh, 2.10, or Colossians 2.10, that it's already been prepared. We don't have to wait for it to cook. It's already ready for us. Amen. Now, I want to talk about your salvation for a minute, and your spirit man. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If you have your Bible, you might want to open there. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, do we have anybody that is in Christ this morning? It means you're born again. You've received Jesus as your Savior. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. When somebody uh, ceases to live in this earth, what do we many times say happened to them? They what? They passed away. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying anything ugly about anybody that's gone on, but when somebody's passed away, what is that actually saying? They're dead. They're dead. We don't like to say dead. So we say they passed away or they've gone to glory. You know, hopefully they went to glory. But we say they passed away. But it literally means they're dead, which means they're not alive here anymore, right? I want you to catch hold of that concept because it's very important. He is a new creation... All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. Now, I'm taking time with this because I want, I want you to, to really get this established in your thinking. If something is a new creation, all things passed away, all things have become new, New means not repaired. I mean, if you go buy a new car, you don't want a repaired car, do you? If you're buying a new car because you're paying a new car price, you want a new car. In fact, if I go buy a new car, I don't even want three miles on it. I want as enough miles it took to get the factory and the truck from the truck to the showroom. If they happen to get three-tenths of a mile on it doing that, that's good, but I don't, want, I don't even want three miles on it. I, if I get a new car, I want a new car. Not repaired. It means not restored. To restore something means to bring it back to its previous condition. But he said, oh, things have passed away. So it's not restored. And new means it's not just healed. It's something that has never existed before. When you're born again, there's something about you that has never existed before. It's something that's new. Amen. In fact, the word new uh, is a Greek word that means recently made, unused, unprecedented, recently born. So if something is new, a new baby is a baby that hadn't been here before, isn't it? It's a new baby. They have a new baby. The Amplified Bible there says a new creature altogether. Previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Previous moral condition is dead. Previous spiritual condition is dead. It's new. Your spirit, when you're born again, is new. It is a new creation altogether. Are you with me so far? All right. 1 John 5.18, we've gone over this several times, and people have come to me and said, I don't understand what that means. Well, you're going to understand what it means this morning. John said, we know that whoever, shout out at me, I'm a whoever. Because see, you're born again. Whoever is born of God does not sin. And somebody be sitting there going, uh-oh. No, don't uh-oh me. Hear me out. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. The Amplified Bible says, 
Christ's divine presence within him preserves him against the evil. In other words, the devil can't get to him. Well, I happen to know, Pastor Mike, the devil's gotten to me. You born again? Mm Mm-hmm. He hadn't got to you? Oh, I know he has. No, now you're just getting ahead of me. You sit there and listen. No. Either you or the word one is wrong. So if the word, which is always right, doesn't agree with your theology, guess who's got to change? Mm -hmm, You do, because the word's not going to change. So let's get some understanding on this. And I realize if you don't have understanding on it, this can be confusing to you. Because you say, well, I'm born again, and I've sinned. No, you haven't. I'm confused. We're going to straighten out your confusion. Once you're born again, your spirit is perfect. Your old flesh doesn't get born again. Your mind doesn't get born again. Your spirit does. So since that's the best part of you now, you need to begin to learn how to obey its callings. Therein is the problem. (laughs) But I don't want to. I know you don't. Your flesh doesn't want to do that. Your mind doesn't want to do it. And the reason it doesn't want to do it is because it hadn't changed any. See, when you're born again, your spirit man is recreated. It's fresh, it's new, it's perfect. And it will never, ever change. It's perfect. We just read the devil can't touch it. So if the devil can't touch your spirit, it can't sin. That's why people ask me sometimes, well, can I, can I, Can a Christian believer be demon-possessed? No. You can be demon-oppressed. Possessed means that you have been taken over spirit, soul, and body. (coughs) Demons can't touch your spirit. Devil can't touch it. So we got some problems in some other places we're going to have to deal with. Isn't that right? But it's not your spirit. And so Christians not understanding this concept have a problem entering into having a righteousness consciousness. Because when you mess up, then you think, well, you know, maybe I wasn't really born again. No, it doesn't have anything to do with you not being born again. It has to do with your thinking and your, and your body not being trained. See, your body's neutral. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but your body just does what it's told to do. That's what it does. Your mind controls your body. Your body don't control your mind. People say, somebody slaps somebody and says, I didn't mean to do it. Yeah, you did. (laughs) Your mind had already configured. Slap them. And your body said, okay. No, you're sorry you did it because they're bigger and they hit harder, but you meant to do it. Oh, man. But your spirit didn't have anything to do with it. Your spirit was saying, if you'll be honest with yourself as a born-again believer, your spirit was saying, "Uh uh-uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't put yourself in that position. It's not worth that. Don't do that. Walk away. But many times... We don't do that, do we? So there's some problems in there, but it's not your spirit, man. Your born-again spirit is perfect. There are no spiritual defects in your spirit that's been recreated. All the spirits of God's children are perfect. Yeah, 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 even even hers, even his. Yep, they're born again. 
if they truly from their heart are born again, the Spirit's perfect. And Hebrews 12, 9 says, God is the Father of spirits. He didn't even say he's the Father of men, does he? He said he's the Father of spirits. God is a spirit, and those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. So your, your spirit is perfect. You can't improve on it. It's as good as it's ever going to be. It's as righteous as it's ever going to be. It's never going to be any less righteous, any less perfect, or any more perfect. It is exactly like your father made of his exact spiritual DNA, and he is perfect. And so is your spirit. If you think this is radical, wait till tomorrow night. Your spirit is as righteous as Jesus. And see, if your mind's not renewed to that, you're sitting there going, oh, heresy. I'm in the wrong church. No, you're in, you're in the right church because this is what you need to hear because this is what the Bible says. See, your spirit is as righteous as Jesus. And Satan can't get to your spirit because your spirit is sealed. It's sealed. Which has two meanings. Your spirit is sealed in that... Um, you ladies may or may not understand this. Sometimes the ladies understand more about cars nowadays than, than the men do. Uh, I remember when, when I got a, a new car several years ago and they quit putting grease fittings. You know, I said, I need to get them all changed and get, I need to get them all, I need to change them all and get greased. That's what we always say. And this guy came back and he says, sir, that we can't grease it. There are no fittings. And I thought, they left fittings off my car. No, the unit now is sealed. And what is in there is just as perfect as it came out of the factory. The grease and everything that's in that fitting is sealed so that nothing can get to it. No grit can get to it. No water can get to it. No oil can get to it. Nothing impure can get to it. And you don't ever have to oil it because you're not going to ever lose any of the stuff that's in there. It's sealed. Also, to be sealed means that you have a mark. You, you know, uh, you, kings used to seal their letters and they'd press their golden mark in wax on a letter that they were sending off with a courier or something. So, you're sealed. Ephesians 1.13 says, After you believed, you were sealed or marked that word also means, with the Holy Spirit of promise. Marked. It says, eternal life. And the devil won't try to get to your spirit because he sees the mark, he knows it's sealed, and it's just useless for him to try. He knows that. But he's, wanting you, he's not wanting you to know that. So he'll try to tell you you're not born again when you mess up, that there's something wrong with your spirit. No, 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 no. Once you're born again, and that is a heart belief, no one knows that but you and God. So don't go judging people. Well, the way they're acting, they ain't born again. You don't know that. There's some people I've had to do their funerals, and I pray I hope they were born again. I didn't know. People get born again on their death bed, breathing their last breath. You're going to get to heaven, and there are going to be people in there that you thought, wow, how did they get here? Then you're going to be looking around for Uncle Jesse Joe, and Uncle Jesse Joe ain't going to be there. <laughs> so heaven is going to be a surprise. <laughs> so don't go around judging people. So uh, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Say with me, my spirit, my spirit is, perfect. is perfect. My spirit, my spirit 
will always be perfect. It will never be less perfect. Which is not even a, a, a usable term, less perfect. That means, I mean, you know, less pregnant or a little pregnant. No, pregnant is pregnant, isn't it? You're not just a little pregnant. Pregnant is pregnant. Well, seal to seal. I know I'm using carnal terms, but you know, we got to get understanding here. The only difference between you and that pregnant lady is your spirit will never deliver. It's there forever, and it'll exist forever in that state of perfection. It's in the Bible. So, where are all the problems? The soul. The soul. The mind. Interchangeable terms. That's your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect, your imagination. Uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 10. When we get about halfway through tomorrow night, it's going to hit you. Now I know why he taught on that. Because you're going to find yourself entering in and you're not going to have to be struggling with it. You can just sit down from the first sentence tomorrow night and just, just take it right on in. Because you're going to know something about yourself. You're going to be sure about something about yourself. And one of the things you're going to be sure of is that your spirit is perfect when you're born again. Nothing wrong with your spirit. Nothing ever going to be wrong with your spirit. My spirit's weak. Nope, it isn't. My spirit's oppressed. No, it isn't. Your spirit's perfect. Well, now the Holy Spirit says it can be grieved. Grief is a mental thing because it's of the flesh, it's of the mind. And the person of the Holy Spirit says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about the perfection within him. It's, it's a mental thing. Your spirit has a mind. I just went down the road. You're not ready to go down yet. So let's, 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 let's keep it in this right here. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Are you there yet? Look at verse 3. And uh, I made a note to read that in the Amplified Bible. So if y'all can put that up there. For though we walk, we live in the flesh, in this natural three-dimensional world. We're not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons. See, if you try to combat the devil with natural means, you'll always lose because he's highly developed in that area. See, that's why if you continue to try to live a Christian life and you'll have your mind renewed by what your spirit receives, see your spirit, you, you, here's the thing about it. I can be teaching something out of the word and your spirit, man, I, I remember this happening when I didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost. I didn't know anything about speaking in tongues. I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I just knew that I think I was going to heaven. But then I began to hear the word of faith and that, that pure word. And my spirit was sitting there going, -hoo 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 -hoo. I mean, it was just taking it in. My mind was going, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't renewed. But once it gets in your spirit, your spirit, if you'll receive it in your spirit, see, I'm not going to always understand what I'm taught. Understanding will come. Because if you receive it in your spirit, down in your most holy faith, your mind will be renewed. See, your mind is renewed through your spirit. Your spirit is not renewed because your spirit's perfect. It doesn't need to be renewed. 
Everything's to be received in your spirit and your mind is renewed. When your mind is renewed, your body will obey. Because it's a neutral element. It just does what your mind tells it to do. So, uh, back into this. For weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. What is a stronghold? It's a monument. It's a monument in your mind that is blocking you from this or that or whatever. A stronghold. Just think of it as a monument. You ever tried to go move a monument? Anybody ever been to the Washington Monument? I've seen pictures of it and I thought, man, that's pretty big. When I got there, you know, <laughs> the thing is huge. It is huge. And many of us have monuments in our mind that act as fences and they block us. And if you try to deal with it, just like you try to deal with a Washington monument by pushing it out of your way, it's just not going to work. You don't have what it takes. So you have to do something else. If I wanted to get rid of the Washington Monument, which I don't, but if I did, I'd blast it. <laughs> which would take something other than my strength. Well, we've got to blast some things out of the Spirit. Now, verse... Four says, for the weapons of our warfare are, are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they're mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds or the monuments in our minds, in our life. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Verse 6 says, Being in readiness to punish every insubordinate for his disobedience when your own submission and obedience as a church are fully secured and complete. That sounded like he just switched off and started talking about somebody. He's talking about this mind. You have to punish every ungodly thought by rejecting it and bringing it under the obedience of what the Word says. See, faith in you is as strong as your knowledge of the Word. Faith comes by what? Hearing the word. You're strengthened by that. So if you have no knowledge, then you're, you're, then you're weak in faith. See, there's, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with your spirit. It's perfect. Acts 20, 32. Look there with me. Acts 20, 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So the inheritance comes through sanctification. I'll explain this, but it's why a lot of Christians... Do not walk in the blessing, although it's available to every Christian. But they haven't changed their mind. And sanctification comes through renewing of the mind. It's a process. You see that. Uh, in fact, let's just go ahead and look at Romans 12. As I often say, your Bible should just flop open there in this church. 
because we, we've been here for two years, it seems like. Verse 1, chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, who is you? Who is you? That's your spirit. The you is your spirit. So he's saying here, I, I want to put it in that terminology, that your spirit presents your body as a living sacrifice. You mean we're supposed to burn our body? No, you prevent your body from doing what it wants to do because it's been trained to do it. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now what I'm leading us into today is so tomorrow night you can hit the road running and receive everything that the Lord is saying to us because you're going to be understanding some things. See, people say, well, I can't change. Yes, well, you can if you allow it. See, change is not something you do. Change is something that you allow. You allow what the Bible says to change your thinking and what you do. And it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Prove to who? Your mind and your body? Because see, you're the you. Your spirit's perfect. Uh, women call it women's intuition. Or we use it, something told me. Or I had a gut feeling. And I've heard people say, well, my gut feeling's always right. That's right. If you're born again, it is always right. It may look wonderful on the outside. I have been offered jobs in the, in the working industry, the business industry before. I was offered one job uh, when I was still an adjuster in Atlanta. I was offered a job to go to California, where we didn't have much business out there then. It was all by mail. And I was offered the position of going and going from adjuster to regional manager, managing an entire region, which at California at that time, the entire region was the entire state. And they were going to triple my salary. Woohoo! Well, that sounded good. But I got an error in my spirit. My mind was saying, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. Although the last place I ever wanted to live on earth was California. But hey, the money was going to be good. And so I happened to know a claims manager on the desk that handled telephone. In California. So I, one ringy dingy, two ringy dingy. I called her up. And I, and, and I said, uh, I've been offered this position out there to be regional manager and uh, come out and organize a region and start bringing in agents and stuff. But it was a big job, a lot of work. Should I take it? She said, well, what's the salary? And I told her what my salary was. And I said, they're going to start me off three times that. She said, well, it takes six times your salary just to rent a house that looks halfway decent. Six times your salary. And I'd already pretty much decided, eh, I'm not going to take that. But if I had paid attention to my mind, then I had that little sucker all the way out there to California. And I would have been three times as bad off as I was over here. Probably, probably couldn't afford a place to live. 
So you see how important it is? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, when you renew your mind by what your spirit receives, your mind then will always make right decisions. That's why it's very scriptural to say, somebody will say something to you, sounds real good, and you say, oh, I'm going to go pray about that. And then they'll go, ah, you always want to pray about it. Well, I'm not going to deal with you if that's a problem. You better believe I'm going to pray about it. We pray about everything. Because there's a lot of propositions that really sound good. And, and you pray and you get the divine counsel of God. Whew. Do you know you have the access to the divine counsel of God? Unlike the people of old, you can now in the spirit realm, walk right up to the face of God and ask him anything. And not leave your prayer closet. That just puts cold chills on me just thinking about it. Um, in Acts 20, 32, where it says that... Uh, and, and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. The Amplified says, the word of grace, which is able to build you up and give you your rightful inheritance among all God's set-apart ones. Say with me, I'm a set-apart one. Set Those consecrated, purified, and transformed of soul. So, uh, as I said earlier, the body, the body is neutral. Your spirit knows the perfect will of God, but it can't get through to your body until your soul, your mind, gets sanctified in line with what the Word says. Because, see, sanctification just means you're a set-apart one. So if you're set apart, see, if I'm set apart, I've got all these other references out here in the world. Psychology books and this book and that book and how to do this book and, you know, computers for dummies and all that kind of stuff, you know. But when I get born again, I am now to be sanctified, set apart to this book. Doesn't mean you can't read and get educated and get degrees in the world. You, you know, you, you have to have them. But they're now filtered through this. And there's some of it you don't need. <laughs> Amen. And so sanctification means your mind is renewed to what the Bible is saying about it now, what God has said about it. And your spirit, man, will just hook right up to it. Because that's God living inside of you. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, and you're probably familiar with this, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth, and I've got in parentheses in my Bible and in my notes, the truth that you know. See, there's a lot of truth in here. I don't know all the truth in here. And I've been studying it a few years. But I know some of it. And the truth that I know, it says, shall make you free. Well, making is a process. The truth that you know, you shall know the truth. And the truth that you know shall develop your sanctification, your set-apartness, your ability to dominate your mind and rule your body. And it becomes a situation where it's not all that much sacrifice to sacrifice your body. Somebody can say, well, you know, let's steal that piece of candy. That's not even temptation to you. Because you're sanctified now. You're set apart and your mind's been renewed to the word. 
See, faith to believe is directly related, as I said earlier, to knowledge. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of it, a lack of knowledge. See, there's always a monument. Maybe, you're, maybe, maybe you have perfected your mind and body in such a way, and you're in here this morning, this doesn't affect you. But for the rest of us, there's always a monument in your mind, in your thinking, that you have to struggle with. Something that you deal with. And maybe you'll deal with something and, and you'll get that taken care of, but then there'll be another thing. And there'll be another thing because there's always that, that's, you know, that's what the devil does. He throws things out there to try to trip you and stumble you. And so we have to deal with him and we have to cast down because he, he throws them out there in the form of imaginations, allurements. And the more you move into sanctification, the more knowledgeable you are to the Word, which means the closer you are connected with the Holy Spirit in you, then those things aren't so monumental anymore. Or you can just put them out of your thinking altogether. So in that sanctification process, you need help. So God has to apply His grace. Somebody say, thank God for His grace. Thank God for His grace. Somebody say, thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His mercy. So even though we know in our thinking and in our actions we're not perfect, God's grace, God's mercy. He told Paul, because Paul was having trouble with monuments of worry and all that kind of stuff. And God says, hey, it's okay, my grace is sufficient. What you can't do on your own, my ability will kick in and I'll take care of it for you. He didn't come in and say, Paul, how many times do I have to tell you? No, he just said, no, I, I'll take care. You do what you can. Paul said it this way, having done all that you know to do, stand. Or the Amplified says, having done all the crisis requires, stand. So when you've done everything that you can do and the monument seems to still be there, just say, hey God, I yield it to you. I cast the care of it over on you. And he will, if you'll listen to him, he'll say, I got this. But he can't take it till you give it to him. You have to yield it to him. Because he won't overrule you. That's why it's important that we get our minds renewed to that. And see, uh, another radical remark I'm going to make to you is your spirit is as strong as God. Got quiet in here. Your spirit is as rich as God. Oh, yeah. And your mind may be really having trouble with that right now. So you need to get sanctified in that area <laughs> because the Word is full of telling you that exact thing. But religion will criticize you and say, who do you think you are? That is blasphemy, saying that you're as strong as God. No, I didn't say I'm as strong as God in my flesh and in my thinking. I said my spirit is. My spirit. Uh, John 10.30, Jesus made a comment. He said, I and my Father are one. And religion said in the very next verse, verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Every time he compared himself with his Father, they picked up stones. So religious thinking will always condemn this message, always. That's what religion will do uh, when you say that you and God are one. Now notice, if you, if you allow Christ in you to come through you, unhindered, you'll live an extraordinary life. 
Let me say that again. If you allow Christ in you to come through you, every part of your being, you'll live an extraordinary life. And he comes through you, through your soul, your mind. But there are fences there that you have to conquer. And if you let him come through you, just let him have it, you'll live an extraordinary life. See that monument in your mind or in your soul is designed to keep you out of your redemption rights. There's a list of them. They were all obtained at the cross. But the devil will throw up roadblocks and monuments to say, well, you're not worthy of that. You're not worthy of that because you did that. You, no, you did that. No. Jesus says, I'm worthy. He said, if you're in the light as I'm in the light, then you'll have fellowship one with the, with the other. So he's asking us to get on his level because he's placed us there. We're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And uh, uh, people, uh, people leave the church uh, out of pride. That's what it is. I, I finally asked the Lord, I said, what is it when people leave? What causes people to leave? He says, well, they get offended. They feel defeated. They don't catch it because they don't want to change. So, you know, somebody can be in a certain state and blame it on the car. Well, I'm driving a Ford. That's my problem. So I'm going to park this and I'm going to get in a Chevrolet. Now things will be all right. No, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> so what, that, what, what are you doing? You're, when you cast blame off on something else, instead of acknowledging your shortcomings and want to change them and enter into sanctification, that's pride. The Bible says pride comes right before the fall. So there's a lot going on here because when that happens, uh, people continue in hurt, and they continue in offense, they continue in failing. Um, um, their ways continue to go down. They're hoping for a change, but they're not willing to change their thinking. They want to go where somebody will agree with them, which doesn't help. I'm going to read Romans 12, 2 in the Amplified Bible and then the message about this. It says, do not be conformed to this world, this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be ye transformed by the entire renewal of your mind. See, we have been called to totally become sanctified. If we've been called to do that, that means we can do it. That means you can receive and walk in the fullness of everything that God's made available for us. Everything. Fullness of your salvation, fullness of prosperity, fullness of health. The message translation says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, Fix your attention on God. Listen, I hope you receive this and, and take it seriously because you're going to have to get this in order to receive what God has to say tomorrow night. And if you miss tomorrow night, you'll be missing what you need for 2019. The message, the prophetic word, um, the only way I can describe it is it's radical, it's way over the top. My son would say, Dad, that was off the chain. That's the way he would put it. So I urge you not to miss it. See, religion makes you one-dimensional. See, everything in, in this natural realm, uh, this is what we call a three-dimensional realm, but it keeps you... Uh, religion keeps you in a three-dimensional world and it won't let you get into the fourth dimension. That's the spirit well. 
uh, Yanji Cho years ago wrote a book called The Fourth Dimension. I don't know if you ever read it. You can go online and get it. I, I read. I said just recently that I'm going to go back and read that book again because I'm looking at it now through different eyes. I couldn't get all of it when I read it the first time. It just kind of went, blah, 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 blah. but I understand it now because he was operating from the fourth dimension. See, we are to operate from the fourth dimension, the light line. We are to operate above the circumstances of life and to dominate them. And, and we're going into the fourth dimension tomorrow night, folks. And religion won't let you get to a place where you can walk on the light line that you hear me talk about so much, uh, above the circumstances, above the monuments in your life. Religion won't let you do it. See, if you can renew your mind to see yourself one with God, you'll be able to easily get into the fourth dimension uh, type of living. It's called the land of the blessing. How many of you want to live in the land of the blessing? Well, he's called you to it. See, over there, you can do extraordinary things. Uh, 3 John 2, he referred to that dimension. He said, Beloved, I pray that King James says wish, but the word actually is pray, if you look it up in the original language. I pray above all things. That's a pretty powerful statement right there, isn't it? I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in health, but it only happens even as your soul prospers, your mind. And the word prosper there means to succeed in business affairs, to be successful, to be well off, to think well and decide well. Mind renewed to the blessing. See, healing comes by way of the cross, though. This morning we had prayer for, and, and I sensed in my spirit there was a tremendous amount of healing and deliverance taking place in people's lives. It came in here heavy. And one of the reasons I like to, when the Lord allows me to do it, pray before a message, I want you delivered so you can receive the message and not have that oppression that you're having to battle with and still here. I like to get that out of the way. I know we're a little bit over time, but I, I do want, uh, I want you to go one other place with me. Matthew 14. If y'all can turn the air a little cooler, maybe. You're familiar with this, but it'll help you kind of visually see this three-dimensional world and the fourth dimension that is referred to all through the Bible, if you really look into it and, and look at it that way. But in verse 25 of uh, chapter 14, um, Jesus had sent him out to go to the other side of the lake. And in the fourth watch of the night, uh, between 3 and 6 a.m. Is, is when that is, um, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. He's operating the fourth dimension. See, when you have authority and dominate time, everything that is in time is subject to what you want to do. And he didn't want to mess with the boat. So he just walked on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for what? Fear. Fear will definitely prevent you from entering into that blessing realm, that fourth dimension where we are to live. See, that's where the kingdom of God is. And where did Jesus say the kingdom of God in? He said it's in us. So that's where we're supposed to live. But immediately, Jesus uh, spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid or do not fear. Peter got it. And he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to walk to you on the water. And he said, Come. And so Peter came down out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. 
Isn't that amazing? Not really. That's where he was called to live anyway. Jesus kept telling his disciples, whatever I do, you can do. And I'll tell you what, you can do even greater things than I can do. Because I go to the Father. Why? Because I'm going to send this Holy Spirit to live in you. And now there are going to be millions of Jesuses around everywhere. And you can do things. Get things done. But they were afraid. And fear keeps you in that one dimension. And to escape this one dimension, you have to escape time. So you've heard me tell you we were born out of a realm of no time placed in a realm of time but we're not to be dominated by time but we are to have rule and domination over time. That's operating in the fourth dimension. This isn't as crazy as it may sound. It, it'll become natural to you as you get your thinking renewed to it. Because this is all about what the Bible is doing. And when Jesus talked to them, Peter caught it. And he went right into the fourth dimension and he walked on the water. So the question comes up with us, because I don't know about you. I put water in the bathtub one time and tried to walk on it. I didn't walk on it. <laughs> I, I, I thought I had the concept, but... Uh, I was all in the natural. <laughs> so here's the thing. How much are you doing without God? This is a question you need to ask. How much are you doing without God? How much are you dominating your efforts over in this natural realm, being governed by what it says and what it influences you to do and what it tells you to do and shows you that you should be doing? How much of that are you doing without God? And the answer is, if you're experiencing delay, 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 then you're attempting to do things without Him. And I'm speaking to myself as well. I mean, when the Lord started showing this to me, I, th there are some things that He instructed me to do years ago, and I still haven't done them. I'm supposed to already be 10 books into uh, what he, he he's, he's already instructed me to write 10 books. And I'm struggling with the first one. And I got all the material. I just hadn't done it. Because I'm busy. Delay, delay, delay. I can sit down with him, write a book in a day. And I got 92 sermon notebooks. That's at least 300, 400 books. Do you know, if I had 300 books out there, I would be a multi, multi-millionaire? Because thousands of them would sell. Hundred, millions of them would sell. You know why? Because it's the truth. This kind of message is not out there all that much. Oh, there's a lot of it out there. You know, there's a lot of great men and women that are, that are writing stuff. But there's more to be seen from different perspectives. And uh, I've just got mine right in here. Right in these four walls for the most part. Occasionally to Africa, occasionally to London. But, you know, it should be far greater I need to have an explosion in my spirit. I'm getting ahead of myself. And see, if you can get out of fear over into faith, that fourth dimension, that's why faith is always now. Faith is never governed by time. It's always right now. You can get into tomorrow, and faith is still right now. And if faith is right now concerning things of tomorrow, you can have today what you thought you could have tomorrow because faith can accelerate time and cause things to manifest today that you only thought you could have tomorrow or next week or next year. I know you're going, mm, now let me see. You just think about it. Think about it. 
And that's where God's taken us to in 2019 with a tremendous explosion. So when you walk in the consciousness that you are a spirit, then all of a sudden time, space, and matter, uh, limitations just go away because they don't matter to you. Healing accelerates. I've prayed for people that to, to heal naturally would have taken them months and they can get it right there or by the time they get home. I've had phone calls People get home and say, I, I'm, I'm totally healed now. With medication to doctors, it might take weeks or months. Increase accelerates. The Lord can touch your finances and do all kinds of things with them if you get over into that realm. Uh, deliverance accelerated. I prayed for a, uh, I, I prayed this for a bunch of people. One, when one woman was in, in a church where I was an elder, she was a, a drunk and demon possessed, not saved. And she comes in the church one night when I was just minding my own business and I actually were, was bringing the message that night. She comes running up the aisle and she dives at me like a tiger and her hands like this and she's screaming and she's saying, I'm going to kill you. And my pastor was standing right there. We were getting ready to pray for people. And both of us at the same time, she was in an ark up in the air to come down on me. And we both just said, Jesus! And she stopped in midair and just fell right to the floor. I mean, it was just like she had run into a wall. We walked over to her. Because we could smell her from the back of the building. She was, at, she was totally just penetrated with it. We walked over there and said, you are delivered in the name of Jesus. She got up, didn't even smell like alcohol anymore, received Jesus, got filled with the Holy Ghost, and when I left Columbia, she was still serving in a position in the church. How long would a rehab take to get you delivered? And I've had people delivered of smoking where it just had their life and just get instant deliver with, with no withdrawals or anything. So sudden things can happen. And scientists tell, we're, uh, tell us we're only using 10% of our brain. What is that other 90% doing? Operating down here. You get over into that realm of the kingdom of God, that's where it's designed to operate. It's just waiting for the word to be put in there. And in these last days, something's going to open all that up. And it's going to be the major part of the church uh, becoming an attraction to the world. And you know, I read in the beginning, uh, he did this that he might clearly demonstrate uh, through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Well, that in the ages to come is here. We are the ages to come. So it's time for us to experience his immeasurable, limitless supply. Do you agree with that? Okay, I got your kick started. Bring your shouting clothes Monday night. Did you get anything out of that this morning?